This is Andre, your host. I find the fulfillment of prophecies amazing. When you look back in history, you see the precision of God's word. But Francois will use the Bible to help us to get a better understanding. The last great conflict will center around the issue of worship and obedience. The sea beast and the land beast will force inhabitants of this planet to worship them. At the same time, God appeals to humanity to worship and obey him. Let's read about this last great conflict in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The book of Revelation can only be rightly appreciated when studied in the light of the book of Daniel. The stories in this book illustrate the nature of the last great crisis. For instance, why were Daniel's three friends cast into the fiery furnace? Well, because they refused to obey a universal Babylonian law that was in conflict with the law of God. The Babylonian king, who was a type of the end-time king of Babylon, erected an image of gold and forced the world through legislation to worship it. This universal religious law divided the loyal and disloyal worshippers of God into two camps. Because the book of Daniel is written for the time of the end, the test will be repeated. Soon, very soon, you and I will be confronted with a choice. Worship God and obey his law, or worship the beast and his law. Let's read about it. Revelation chapter 13 from verses 14 to 17. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. In spite of the fact that there will be an almost universal following after the beast, there will be some who will refuse to worship him. Listen to John's description. Revelation 14 verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. How will people manage to obey God's law in the face of death? The answer comes from John 14 verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command. In order for us to clearly see the end-time issue on worship, loyalty and obedience, Daniel chapter 6 gives us another gripping story. The manner in which Daniel worshipped God offended his religious friends. You see, he was a vegetarian who worshipped God on the Sabbath. He studied the prophecies and was a man of prayer and piety. And don't forget, Daniel is a type of those who live the time of the end. In order to get rid of Daniel, the religious leaders got the king to pass a law concerning worship. For 30 days, people were to worship only the king. The church employed the state to pass a universal law, forcing people to obey a man-made law in violation of God's law. God did not cause a rapture to save Daniel from the lion's den in the time of trouble. Daniel had to demonstrate to the world that loyalty to God and obedience to his law was more important than life itself. And God was demonstrating to the universe how he saves people who obey him in spite of threats of death. What happened to the religious leaders who promulgated this religious law that passed the death sentence to all who disobeyed? Daniel 6 verse 24, at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. 
Will the exact same scene be enacted at the end of time? Most certainly. Why? Because Daniel is written for the times in which we live. When the kings and rulers eventually realize that the religious leaders misled them in passing laws to kill God's people, they will retaliate. Revelation 17 verse 16 The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. May God help you and me to be on the side of the winning team, the obedient team. There is absolutely no future in disobeying God. He has died for us on the cross of Calvary, and all he's asking us is to show our appreciation by obeying him in the strength that he supplies. Because of the great onslaught on God's law in these end times, it will be profitable for us to study about the different kinds of law mentioned in Scripture. First of all, there were the civil laws. They guided the Israelites in matters of daily living, court cases, personal rights, sanitation, etc. They are no longer binding, although the principles are still valid. Another set of laws were called the ceremonial laws. It is a very rewarding study because Jesus is the theme of this entire ceremonial system. The showbread and the seven-branched candlestick represented Christ. The lamb in the ceremonial law was a type of the antitypical lamb of God who would one day come and shed his blood for guilty sinners. The high priest carried the names of the twelve tribes on his heart and represented Jesus, our heavenly high priest, who carries us on his heart and intercedes for us. In the ceremonial system, the altar of incense was placed opposite the veil. Before the high priest could enter the most holy place, he had to take the sweet-smelling incense with him. These represented the merits of the Lamb of God. And today when you and I pray, our prayers ascend to the Father, mixed with the sweet-smelling merits of the perfect character of Christ. The entire ceremonial system pointed forward to the greatest event in history, the sacrificial death of the Lamb of God. Question. What happened to the ceremonial law when Christ died on the cross? The system of ceremonies came to an end they were nailed to the cross. Let's read about it. Colossians 2 verse 14 Having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Verse 17 These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The written code or handwriting of ordinances, as the King James Version says, is called hierographon in Greek. It means a document written by hand. Which law was nailed to the cross? The moral, the ceremonial or the civil law? The ceremonial law, of course. This is a very important issue because there are people who teach that the moral law was nailed to the cross. They say there is no difference between the two laws. Let's hear what the Bible says concerning the ceremonial law. Deuteronomy 31 verse 26 Take this book of the law and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. Do you notice the difference between the two laws, the ceremonial and the moral? The ceremonial law written by Moses on parchment was placed beside the ark. The moral law written by God on tables of stone was placed inside the ark. The material on which the ceremonial law was written was parchment. What does that tell us? It's temporary in contrast to the Ten Commandments which were written by God himself on stone, a symbol of endurance. Tell me, which law did John see in heaven, the ceremonial or the moral? Of course it was the moral, the eternal law of God. Why? The ceremonial law was nailed to the cross. Listen to what some scholars have to say on this matter. 
The ceremonial law is properly abrogated and its obligation and authority utterly taken away and repealed. For so the apostle is to be understood when, in his epistles, he often speaks of the abrogation of the law. He speaks, I say, of the ceremonial law and ironical observances. This comes from the book An Exposition of the Ten Commandments, page 21. There are people who still cling to the outmoded ceremonial laws and keep certain feast days. What are they actually saying by doing it? They deny the fact that Jesus came in the flesh and died for our sins. Although the law given from God by Moses as touching ceremonies and rites doth not bind Christians, yet notwithstanding, no Christian whatsoever is free from obedience of the commandments which are called moral. This comes from doctrine and discipline of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Luther said concerning the three laws, the ceremonial law was only a shadow of Jesus and ended at the cross. The civil law ended when the Jews as a nation ceased to exist. But the moral law reflects the character of God. Jesus expects us to still obey its precepts. Do you recognize these soldiers? They are from Greece. Whenever I visit abroad, I inquire about the whereabouts of the Adventist church. Come with me. I want to show you something interesting. You are looking at the Greek name of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Athens. Let's walk inside and look at something very impressive. Here you see the Ten Commandments written in Greek. John Calvin said, Do not think that the incarnation of Christ exempts us from obedience to the law because it is the everlasting standard for a consecrated and holy life. The moral law is so unchangeable as the righteousness of God which is revealed therein. This comes from the commentary of A Harmony of the Gospels, part 2, page 277. The ceremonial laws can be compared to scaffolding that is used in the construction of a building. Once the building is complete, they are removed because they have served their purpose. When Christ came, the building of salvation was complete. The moral law can be compared to the foundation of a building. It is immovable. If you destroy the foundation, you destroy the building. Let's do an interesting comparison between the law of God and the ceremonial law. The first one was written by God's hand, Deuteronomy 4 verses 12 and 13. Moses wrote the second one, Deuteronomy 31 verse 24. God's law was placed inside the ark, 1 Kings 8 verse 9. The ceremonial law was placed outside the ark, Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. God's law was written on tables of stone, Deuteronomy 4 13, while the ceremonial law was written in a book, Deuteronomy 31 verse 24. The moral law remains forever, Psalms 111 verse 7 and 9. The ceremonial law ended at the death of Jesus, Colossians 2.14. The first one points out sin, Romans 7 verse 7. The second one was added because of sin, Galatians 3.19. The moral law addresses man's whole duty to God, Ecclesiastes 12.13. The ceremonial law dealt only with carnal ordinances, Hebrews 9 verse 10. Let's ask the Bible itself to give us a profile of the characteristics of the moral law. Psalms 19 verse 7 The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Romans 7 12 So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Verse 14 We know that the law is spiritual. You may find some defects in God's creatures, but you will never find a defect in His holy law because it is a transcript of His character. Psalms 119 verse 172 May my tongue sing your word, for all your commands are righteous. Psalms 119 verse 152 Long ago I learned from your statutes, 
that you establish them to last forever. Henry F. Light wrote these words just before he died. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. I'm so glad that God does not change. I'm so grateful that his law never changes. It gives me a sense of security. Psalms 119 verse 89 Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Jesus says in Matthew 5 18 I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear. This is the Harbour Bridge at Sydney, Australia. It spans this huge body of water and connects two suburbs of Sydney. When Jesus became man, he became our divine bridge who spans the space between heaven and earth. What was his attitude towards the law? In Luke 2 verse 49, Jesus says, I must be about my father's business. And every business, of course, is based on definite laws. In John 5.30 he says, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Matthew 5.17 Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When you study the perfect life of Christ, you discover that he obeyed God's law perfectly. And because of his perfect obedience, you and I can be saved. What does the law do for sinners? In other words, how must I relate to the law? Will obeying its precepts save me? Romans 3.20 Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. The function of the law is to make us aware of our sinful condition. James 1 verses 23 to 25 Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. When I look into God's mirror, his spirit convicts me of my fallen condition. Romans 7 verse 7 What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, Do not covet. There are very obvious reasons why the devil is waging a war against the law of God. He does not want you and me to see how imperfect we really are. You see, if I do not realize my sinful condition, I will never feel my need of a saviour. 1 John 3 verse 4 defines sin in this manner. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is contrary to God's will for my life. I like the definition of the function of the law in Romans 3.19 where it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The King James Version says the law shows us how guilty we are. I'm so glad the law of God convicts me. I need it because this is the only way in which I can discover my weaknesses and repent. John Wesley says Jesus sends us to the law, and once we have seen our sinful condition, the law sends us back to Christ for cleansing and for forgiveness. There is no future in a life of continual, willful sinning. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, we should fight against our evil tendency to sin continually. Let's examine the 
beautiful message that obedience to God's law leads to liberty. Psalms 119 verse 45 I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. When you get jailed, when you break the commandment which says, Thou shalt not steal, your liberty is gone when you murder somebody. At times it is extremely hard and difficult to resist temptation to sin. But I want to tell you that suffering the consequences of sin is much harder. Let's see what the law is unable to do for us. A man is parked on a loading zone. The traffic officer fines him 50 rand. Can the law forgive the offender? No. How can he be at peace with the law? Only when he pays the fine will the law set him free. The same principle applies to the moral law. It cannot forgive the sinner. Matthew one twenty one says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus and Paul had a hard time convincing the spiritual leaders of their day that obedience to the law does not earn their salvation. Salvation is a gift that can only be attained by faith. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Romans 3.20 This verse does not say that we should not keep the law. It says we must not see obedience to the law as a means of earning the Lord's righteousness. Galatians 3 verse 21 For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Obedience is never the root of my salvation. It is always the fruit of my salvation. Can your child earn your love? No, he or she already has it. How can a child express his gratitude for his parents who gave him birth, love and an upbringing? The answer is loving obedience. And this is what God expects from us. John 15 verse 10 If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Are you interested in keeping up a love relationship with the Lord? Then obey his commandments. But how? We are all so sinful and weak. The secret of obedience is a living connection with Christ. Let us read a few verses that will help us understand how to maintain that close connection with him. John 15 verse 5 I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What a tremendous verse. If I want to bear the fruit of obedience, there is only one thing for me to do. Remain in Christ. Stay close to Him through prayer and Bible study. Only in Christ can we find power to obey His law. Never underestimate what God can do for you. His power is unlimited. And because of this provision, there is no excuse for us to sin willfully. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God's holy law in itself cannot deter me from sinning. I have to go to Christ, the lawgiver, to give me power to obey. When I come to him in all humility and plead with him to make me obedient, he performs the miracle. Hebrews 8 verse 10 This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. 
I will be their God and they will be my people. God has written his law of aerodynamics into the DNA of every bird. But when Adam sinned, that spontaneous desire to do God's will was wiped out of our DNA. Can this situation be reversed? Ezekiel 36 verse 26 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The law of God shows me my lost condition, but what does his grace do for me? This is such an encouraging study. Let's read a few beautiful verses of scripture on this issue. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a precious gift. Do you realize what this gift cost God? The death of Jesus on Calvary. Acts chapter 13 verses 38 and 39 Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Not only do we receive forgiveness, we also receive justification. Romans 6 verse 23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an extravagant God! He not only forgives, He also justifies. And on top of it all, He gives us eternal life. Matthew 1 verse 21 You are to give Him the name Jesus, because He will save His people from their sins. Listen to more good things that come to us through God's grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. In Christ, my friend, we have all that we need to inherit eternal life. But he also wants to reflect his character in our lives. Ephesians 2 verse 10 For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What a promise! His grace will enable you and me to produce good works, which will bring honor to his name. Romans 1 verse 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. When I allow God in my life, I have power to cope with the temptations of life. God's grace brings power to overcome every besetment. Please believe him. Maybe you've tried in vain to gain the victory over sin. Maybe you've tried in vain to keep God's commandments it could be a lack of an entire commitment to him. Before God told ancient Israel to obey the Ten Commandments, he reminded them of the fact that they had been redeemed, saved by grace, sola gratia, and only because they've experienced his redemption could they obey his law. And the same rule applies today. Only redeemed people can obey 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary and redeemed the entire human race. This was the greatest demonstration of divine love in the history of our planet. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5 Jesus invites every sinner to behold him on the cross of Calvary. And if this generates feelings of remorse for sin and repentance, he says in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And remember, 
all his biddings are enablings. Thank you, Francois. Dear listener, I trust you found the lecture informative and interesting. One thing is sure, God will never disappoint his children. He is coming again. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that although we experience disappointments here on earth, you know all about them, and soon you will change our disappointments into joy. May everyone listening cling to this hope. In Jesus' name, amen.